Namaskaram to all. Mr. Rahul made my job easy because the introduction which I should have given to our country, our society, our civilization, our history has been made easy by him. I will proceed from where he left. He said that basically our idea of India, the notion of India, the civilization, its culture, its religion is a concept that is denied to the modern Indians. The modern Indians are oblivious of what India is or was or what it is going to be. See, India was a, a lost civilization. It was an idea which was forgotten by the world. Though it was the only civilization which had comprehended the world and laid down an agenda as to how the diversity of the world can coexist and still find unity at various levels, whether at religious level, philosophic level, economic level. And India had been a pathfinder to the world. And when Angus Madison wrote his Economic History of the World in the year 2001 and said, for 1500 years from the 1st century AD to the 15th century, India was the leading economic powerhouse of the world with uh, its GDP crossing 33 to 35 percent throughout. And in the 16th century, India lost out to China and again regained it in 17th century. That means for 1700 years, India was the number one nation in the world virtually except for one century. And it shook the world. In fact, many people didn't believe Angus Madison that uh, a country could lead so consistently and so powerfully and yet not dominate the world. The most important thing is you have the power and still don't use that power to dominate the world. This is one civilization which never sent out a soldier to conquer anybody and to rule. And who said this? It is not Swami Vivekananda who said this on 9-11. 1993. It is the Chinese ambassador to America who said in the year 1400 that here is a civilization which never sent out a soldier to conquer China but ruled China mentally, religiously, psychologically and philosophically for 2000 years. So the capacity of India to influence the world without force, without use of power whether it is political or economic or even cultural, has been a demonstrated power. For example, when Buddhism went to China, it is not that some evangelists went from here and turned China into a Buddhist country. China sent its people, its scholars, Huan Song, they came to India to learn about Buddhism and then took Buddhism there. India never sent out even evangelists. So you must understand there is something fundamentally different from this country because as Lord Krishna says, you don't go and preach religion. Somebody is interested in religion, he will come and learn. So you only create interest in people for knowledge and the kind of knowledge that they want, they will come and seek. It is the seeker of the knowledge who is entitled to gain knowledge and you don't impose knowledge, you don't impose religion, you don't impose God, you don't convert anybody and it is anathema. If anything has brought about enormous amount of distress in this world, it is the concept that my God is superior to your God. If I say this, I am speaking as a Hindu. But the person who said this was not a philosopher. He was not a religious leader. He was a professor, a layman, John Pierre Lehman, who was the, who is the IMD professor, who was the Head of the who was the advisor to the WTO in Pan, when Panish Pakli was the head of the WTO. He said the biggest distress that has taken over this world, which is more manifest today than ever was, was the monotheistic religions, which believed that my God is superior to all other gods, and that has become the cause of the clash of religions in the past and civilizations today. And he said. Only a religion which develops the capacity of the people to worship many gods. And you must be able to accept many gods. Mr. Rahul said that we could accept an Ayapa and a Vapa at the same time. Anywhere you go, you can find anybody in India going to any place of worship. And you can see millions and millions of Hindus going to this, uh, uh, this Nagur 
Darga, which is a Muslim monument, and you can see them going to this Velankani. It makes no difference to them because this is a culture which has reared respect for all gods. In fact, uh, Mr. Rahul said that in 1910 we had about 22 crore people, 20 crore people, but uh, the number of gods we had is 33 crore gods. We had more gods than the number of population, the number of people worshipping. And we were comfortable with these gods. And we made peace between gods. We made gods marry each other and see that there was no dispute between gods. And that is why we could create religious peace. But the single god religions, I am very sorry to say because single god religions will have to correct themselves. And my god is superior, your god is inferior, your god is false. My book is correct. Your book is wrong. This has exterminated nations. This has exterminated civilizations. And Pierre Lehman says, in this era of globalization, if global trade, global economics, global interaction has to survive. If they have to make an impact on this world for the overall development of the world, you need a social fabric. You need a religious idea. You need a philosophic platform on which you can make people work together, think together, despite all the differences. The capacity to digest the differences, the capacity to overcome the effect of differences, the capacity to make people feel that there is a higher unity that is operating beyond all that one sees and feels. That is the way that our philosophers, our great saints and seers have shown. You know, one Christian uh, scholar came to the Shingeri Shankaracharya, Chandrasekharendra Bharati. This conversation took place about 60 years ago. And he wanted to become a Hindu. And you can see there is a book printed of the dialogue between them. That man wants to become the Hindu. He says, don't become a Hindu. You be a good Christian. Your religion has enormous amount of capacity to lift you to the level of attaining God. Seeing God, feeling God, attaining God. Why should you want to become a Hindu? This is the approach of this nation. You be truthful to your religion. You read your book well. You understand your people well. It is not that my book is superior unless you read my book. You are a kafir or you are a heathen. This is what has destroyed the world. If today there is a talk about civilizational clashes. If there is a talk about the world getting into more and more terror. It is because of two reasons. One, my religion is superior, my God is superior and you have to accept it. And if you don't accept it, then we have a battle. Swami Vivekananda said in those days that whether your God is superior or my God is superior, let us have a boxing match to decide who is superior. And that has now become an issue of war. It has become an issue of terror. And there is another God called modernity. Modernity says I am right. Everybody else is wrong. You must dress like me. You must speak like me. You must read like me. You must speak in English like me. And if you don't do that, you are inferior. We have that way demonstrated that there are two classes of people. The people who understand modernity and are quote-unquote modern and others who are unmodern, anti-modern and who are out of tune with times and they have to be and they were exterminated. You know, in America the number of Native Americans who were exterminated by diverse means was estimated at one point as 140 million and that has now virtually crossed to 200 million. People were exterminated only on the basis that you are not fit to live in a modern world. Modern world is what I define as the modern world. So monotheism and modern world share the same character and that is the cause of the problem. And we are now not veiling people. As uh, Mr. Rahul said, that our, our culture and civilization are spread throughout the world. In fact, an IFS officer has written a book that how in the villages of Vietnam, even today, there are Vedic Pandits who are reciting the same Vedas which our Vedic Pandits recite here. There is absolutely no connection between them except cosmic connections. Vedas were never reduced into books except in the times of Krishna Devaraya. It was all oral tradition, the musical pattern, the, the, in, uh, the whole idea of song or music 
as the method of transmitting from one generation to the other knowledge of a kind which could never be grasped by any material means was demonstrated by the vedas and in this country today all this was placed at a discount in the last 200 years we brought in an education system which said that you have to become un indian non indian anti indian and then only you can understand the world you handle the world and we began distancing ourselves from our own moorings our culture our traditions and we began discarding this as irrelevant and which will not aid our own development this is the extent to which we were alienated from our own self our own soul our own parents our own forefathers swami vekananda said that when you are educated in the modern model you consider that your father was next door neighbor to brutes this is how you were taught about how to value your own heritage now india is in a very different position it's a rising political power today it's a military power today there are researches which show by 2025 india will be the third largest power and powers like russia germany france uk will all become regional in character india will have about 14% of global power china will have 16% of global power and america will have a share of 18% of global power this is the study by the cia so we are not going to be we are talk about our poverty we have talk about illiteracy there is poverty in india india is not poor there is illiteracy in india india is not illiterate we are equating the country with its faults america has all kinds of problem there is a 51% single parent families in america where father and the mother do not lead the family the father and the mother do not coexist unwed mothers 33% of the uh, uh, pregnant women are unwed sometimes school going children there are crushes attached to school uh, problems and problems but america is not branded as problems america brands itself as a technologically advanced country educationally advanced country and the branding of any country is not based on poverty yes poverty is there which country poverty is not there 7% of the americans take free food food tickets are sold to them the american the below poverty line americans are in about 9% today it is uh, economic crisis has led to these results but we have we have been told to brand india through the negative ideas about india the problems of india instead of seeing it problems of india we have begun seeing india itself as a problem and now there is a very different idea emerging about india outside india and that has to percolate and penetrate to india and the finest example i can give is the latest study of goldman sachs about what india is going to be in the next 20 years they say that india will be the drive of the world paper number 187 goldman sachs you must download it from internet and read it says that india will be generating a savings of 40% of gdp consistently from now to 2026 and the amount of annual savings that india will be generating from 2016 will be equal to 800 billion dollars which is equal to all the bank advances of all the banks in india today and it says that india will be spending 1.7 trillion dollar on infrastructure for which it will not be importing even 1 dollar as foreign investment because india will not need it and this 1.7 trillion dollar uh, infrastructure investment will drive the economy of the world you know what is the reason for this it is the cultural foundation of india which is the reason for this india was sought to be converted into a consumerist society a plan that completely failed india has brought about its own economic model it was told that you can never develop without foreign investment we have developed without foreign investment we are on the course to achieve something great without any need for foreign investment the entire indian economy developed with 1.5% foreign investment in india 98.5% of the investment was generated by indians themselves nobody thought india was capable of generating resources to this extent the entire thing is because of the balanced lifestyle to which we have been introduced by our seers our saints our religion our culture our society and i spoke in sunny valley in america a speech which is there on the you youtube you can go into it says 
Indian economy is basically feminine in character. Indian society is feminine in character. Indian culture is feminine in character. Indian politics is feminine in character. And that is why even today non-aggressiveness permeates the Indian viewpoint. And that is why in India we did not have a war model to destroy the world. One of the reasons which Rahul mentioned that we did not dominate the world because we didn't develop even a regular army. You know, in our war rules, we were such so human as A.L. Basham says, no civilization produced such great rules of war that if somebody said, I cannot fight you, you cannot consider him as your enemy. If somebody is wounded, you cannot consider him as the enemy. If somebody turned his back, you cannot hit him. A man on the wars cannot fight with the man on the street. You know, these were all the noble rules of war. A king who won, he could not grab the kingdom of the other person. He has to restore him back. If that man doesn't want to take, you must find a cousin of him. If that person also doesn't want to take, you must go to the people and ask who will protect your culture, tell us and that man will have to be appointed as the king. Such rules of war, such rules of statecraft, that such rules of nation building existed nowhere. Between a barbarian culture which invaded us, barbarian army and politics which invaded us, with this kind of noble thoughts, noble methods, noble warfare, noble politics, you were nowhere. And so we lost because of nobility and this we must understand. And we are in a position to demonstrate this nobility, make it a winner. And everybody thought noble and grand civilizations and sober civilizations will never succeed. Now there is a chance for India to prove that being noble, being good, being sober can be a winner. Because we have been a winner for 1700 years in succession and we lost out for two centuries for no fault of ours just because we were good we lost out and being good is going to be the most important claim to global leadership and India is on way to becoming a global leader and you are all going to be part of that India we were part of the India we were demeaned derided debranded you are going to be the leader of India part of India which is being branded differently and you are going to enjoy that India, that power, that moral power, that sober power. And I am extremely happy. I am addressing the future Indian who are going to enjoy that power. Thank you very much.